Good morning, Heather. Morning. Good to see you. Yes, good to see everyone. Well, you know what, Heather? I actually just went through the preliminaries. And, okay. Uh, so, you know, what we'll do again, if everybody could have their accounts on mute and then we'll uh, open it up for questions. Heather is going to make a few um, opening comments about our gathering and then we can proceed on. And thanks again for everybody for joining us uh, relatively early in the day to uh, talk some pit athletics. Heather, I'll hand it off to you. Great. Thank you, EJ. Uh, welcome, everybody. The latest day of Zoom. Here we go. Um, uh, you know, I appreciate you, you having a chance to, to talk with everybody. Um, I'm actually uh, just last night was our very biggest event I've ever I've been to in the past uh, four, four months, I guess it was. Um, I'm out here at Laurel Valley uh, Golf Club for the third annual Pat Narduzzi golf event. Um, and you know, it was uh, scheduled to be earlier in the summer, um, but fortunately we were able to, to be able to do this safely. And uh, so I just watched everybody tee off and they said, you're not playing golf today, Heather? And I said, no, I actually have to meet you guys at 8.30. So you are my excuse not to play well or bad, <laughs> good or bad today. Um, uh, but anyway, it's, it's great to see everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it honestly was so nice to see all of our, you know, a number of our key donors and supporters and, and Coach Narduzzi, Coach Bates, Coach Whipple are all here um, just, to, just from a social distancing gathering. Uh, Dan Marino's in town, Jimbo Covert. It's a nice, nice group. And um, so we're, we're thankful for the people that have come out today to, to support our football program. Um, the gazillion million dollar question, obviously, they all want to know is, are we playing and when and all that sort of thing. But, um, but I'll just talk, talk to you a little bit about big picture. Um, uh, you know, obviously, we're still managing through the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, following, um, you know, just honestly, the trends in the country uh, are not where we want them to be. Um, I know everybody's, you know, taking this seriously and doing the best that we can, but um, right now we're just not in an ideal spot in the country, as we all know. Um, and uh, we continue to just manage through uh, the issues every day, every week. It's sort of, you know, tracking on what's happening. Um, you know, our goal and number one goal will always be to keep our student athletes safe and our staff safe. Um, and so the safety of, of what we're doing is, is paramount. Um, we'd love to have everybody back and things to be, um, you know, so, sort of a new normal, but we're taking it day by day and really evaluating things. We have a very thoughtful, detailed plan that we've rolled out. Uh, obviously, it was developed with our staff and the medical team here at UPMC who are extraordinary. Um, so we've really relied on their medical guidance with regards to bringing kids back and bringing staff back. So we're about halfway through the phases on the student athletes. Um, we have, you know, football, men's and women's basketball, men's and women's soccer, women's volleyball, wrestling, um, gymnastics, and men's and women's swimming back. So we have about 300 student athletes here back on campus that we have brought in in phases. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been managed, I think, very well according to plan. And, and, um, and we've had to adjust a little bit as well. For example, when football first came back, you know, every student athlete goes into a 14-day quarantine period, the initial quarantine when they come back. Um, uh, they have the option to be tested if they choose. Um, that is their choice. Um, obviously, if anyone is symptomatic, we test them immediately. Um, everybody fills out a daily health questionnaire on your phone um, and obviously trying to identify any concerns or issues there. Um, and, you know, we have all the protocols in place and masks and, you know, um, hand washing and social distancing. Our, our meeting rooms are all set up with social distancing in mind. All the football rooms have been converted. Every team room has been converted that way. Um, and, and then basically with football and, and each of the teams, they were quarantined for two weeks and then they have, their, they worked out in groups of 10 for two weeks. And then we were scheduled to go to groups of 50 
Um, we did not because the governor's orders, you know, kind of scaled back because things were escalating here in West, Western Pennsylvania. So we're in groups of 25 um, and we'll do that for, for a while now um, just to get kids back safely and, and hopefully manage things the best we possibly can. So um, that's where we're at with regards to, you know, kind of returned to campus. Um, the university has been extraordinary. Chancellor Gallagher has been a uh, Herculean effort to, to kind of shut our university down and then help us plan to build it back up. We are planning for a hybrid, high flex academic model in the fall. Uh, classes are set to get, start on August 19th, which was a little earlier than um, we had originally planned, um, but the hope is to have everything done by Thanksgiving and then, um, you know, keep our, our students here on campus. Uh, you know, we obviously eliminated things like Labor Day and, and that sort of thing. So um, we're in the mode of, of returning to play. Um, it's been busy. I, I had a real privilege to um, testify yesterday before the U.S. Senate and Judiciary Committee on some issues and happy to talk about that. Um, but our staff has been um, just extraordinary, uh, really adapting when they need to um, and, and trying to make the most of our situation and, and keep everybody safe and, and yet try to, uh, you know, build some momentum back because I know we're all, uh, you know, it's interesting just being here last night. There, there's such a, a value of human contact and relationships, and it's so hard to do it from a distance. And so, um, but we know we have to do it from a distance for a while. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm optimistic about us moving forward. It's, it's, uh, it, there's a pace about it, and there's patience that we have to have, and we have to be nimble. Um, there's no doubt that we're going to have to be nimble. Uh, things are going to change and evolve. And I would honestly say there's nothing set in stone right yet. So I'm happy to answer questions about uh, whatever you'd like to talk about and, um, and you can fire away. Heather, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to our time honored tradition. Jerry, we'll put you in the leadoff spot. If you could get us started, please. And you can take your mute off now, my man. If I had a dollar for every time we tell somebody that, right? Right. <laughs> um, I'll leave the tough questions to Chris, but uh, Heather, um, I'm interested to, to uh, hear about your, your uh, testimony yesterday, how it's been received, and, and what kind of feedback you're getting, either positive or negative, from people in, in Congress or just anywhere. Yeah, um, I, I think it's been well received. I have um, gotten a number of messages across the country from colleagues and, um, you know, in, within the ACC and outside across the country, um, you know, somewhat of, you know, thanks for carrying the torch on this particular and important issue. Um, I think we all uh, recognize that gambling is omnipresent in our country, um, but the the addition of college gambling is a different level and i just really tried to draw the distinction between what college athletes are like and what a college campus is like versus the professional world um you know college athletes and are, are part of a bigger ecosystem as i mentioned you know they're a part of a giant university community they are students they are in classrooms and yet they are also playing on fields of play or on courts and such. And so, um, you know, this isn't their full-time job. You know, they're not a jockey, they're not a boxer, they're not an auto racer, they're not a professional football, basketball player. They are a student and an athlete. And um, I, I just think that they are much more susceptible to financial temptations than, um, than other professional athletes and I, just don't think it is good for the integrity of any game um, and the proliferation of it, of whether it's online, legal, illegal, all of that is, um, you know, it's, it, it, there, there's concern about the safety of your kids, about the temptation that you expose them to. Um, and I think that there's enough pressures in a college student athlete's lives to not add that one. And I think the sentiment of the Congress, uh, 
was positive, uh, you know, frankly. Um, Senator Graham, I think they appreciated the perspective. I appreciate the fact that, you know, if, if we're going to have legislators involved in, you know, kind of getting involved in college athletics, that they hear and they listen and they're willing to learn or understand how it really is on a campus or what student athletes really do go through. And, and I think a lot of the questions that were raised during the NIL testimony indicated their willingness to learn and, and kind of need to understand better that today's college student athlete and experience is dramatically different than it was 25 years ago. Um, the things that we're allowed to provide now have grown. Now, are we at the place where we need to be? Probably not. We need to continue to evolve, but it is a very different student athlete experience today as it was 25 years ago. Heather, is there talk about drawing up some legislation? Any plans in that regard? Um, you know, that we have, uh, with regards to gambling, uh, that is that will be up to the, the senators. I mean, that will be up to the Congress to actually draw up the legislation. They simply could say that we prohibit gambling on college sports across the country, and then all the state laws would obviously be repealed. Um, the NIL legislation is much more tricky and, and, and complicated, um, and we've given them some guidelines, and I think that they are going to work, continue to work on guidelines or what they referenced as a Bill of Rights for student athletes. Thank you. Sure. Heather, I mean, you mentioned the student athlete experience is different than it was 25 years ago, but there was gambling going on college athletics 25 years ago. There was gambling going on college athletics 70 years ago with the CCNY basketball team. I mean, is it feasible to expect, I mean, Phil Steele has a cottage industry built on, you know, his whole magazine is about gambling. And it's very popular. I mean, so is it feasible to expect, you know, the, the government to, to step in into an industry that frankly makes a lot of money for a lot of people? Well, I, I think that the, there's no question that the gambling industry, um, is not ever going to go away. It has been in existence and it will be in existence. What I would like to see is that it does not infilter into college athletics from a legalized standpoint. Um, people, you know, they, they, we, we talked about that, whether, you know, what was it like when it, when gambling on college sports is illegal, obviously, except for in Nevada, but it, it was illegal. If it's, legalized, there will just be more people willing to do it. There's more exposure. And the difference in student athletes 25 years ago, um, I would say that, you know, if you were a bookie or somebody like that, that you had to, you know, figure out a way to get in touch with a student athlete. You had to hang out a stadium and see them leaving and walking to their car or walking them, seeing them walk across campus or try to figure out how to connect to their buddy or their roommate or their classmate. Now with, you know, devices, they can just follow them on Instagram or follow them on any of their social media platforms. And I just think there's a lot more exposure and access to student athletes today than there were there, than there was, you know, years ago. Um, and the proliferation of online betting makes it, simply so easy to turn your venues, uh, you know, college football stadium into a, you know, mini casino if you're, and, and then think about the addition of prop bets and all the, you know, addition of that. It, again, it exacerbates, it, it just exp exponentially grows, um, in my opinion. Hey, Heather, uh, in, in regards to, you know, 2020 football scheduling and stuff, the the whole geographic uh, pods, you know, with home and home contests, it has been kind of an idea that's been floated out there for the ACC, minimize travel, regionalize games, all that. What are your thoughts on, on that idea, uh, that, that notion that that's possible? Yeah, we have absolutely discussed a lot of iterations. Um, you know, we, we have meetings. I have a meeting with them at 930. Um, we meet every Tuesday and Thursday and or as needed additionally um and uh we've we've evaluated all of that john i think we've 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 talked to you know we've talked about minimizing travel and trying to regionalize things um also keep um you know the coastal and atlantic divisions intact and you know i mean it, it's been a 
there's been a whole wide variety of, of issues. We have not settled on one decision yet. Um, but I would say every kind of iteration that you could come up with, we've talked or discussed um, and evaluated the pros and cons of, of that. Um, and ultimately, you know, we want to play a conference schedule um, as long as we're able to do it safely. Um, and we will follow, you know, obviously the ACC has a medical advisory group. There's one member from every institution on the medical advisory group, and the medical advisory group is setting out guidelines. These are the expectations and the minimum expectations for what you'll need to do to be able to play safely. Um, we'll follow those, and um, and we're, we're, we're trying to hone in on a final decision um, with regards to what our schedule looks like, but we have not yet done that. Another scheduling question, too. Uh, the, this, the Colonial announced that there would be – no football in the fall for them, but they open it up to the individual schools to say, hey, if you want to put together a schedule, you can. From what I've read, it doesn't seem Richmond will do that. Have you been in contact with those guys down there about potentially rescheduling that game, settling that game in any way, or have there been any talks there? Uh, we have been in touch with all of our non-conference opponents, for sure, just to be, you know, to reach out, to understand, and um, to have real transparent communication going back and forth with regards to what their plans are. Because even if they were available to play, we would need to make sure that they were meeting the medical guidelines of our ACC medical advisory group in order to play them. Um, and so we've communicated that as well. So, you know, if there's a chance that we're gonna play a non-conference school, they are gonna have to meet those medical um, guidelines. And so, um, yeah, we, we have been in touch um, we, again, we have not made any final decisions at all, but we, we are understanding kind of Richmond's position at the, or this situation at this time. Heather, um, good morning. Uh, what is your level of confidence that you're going to have a football season at this point? I mean, you, you've you talked about going through all the scenarios and, and, you know, we're getting ready for this and that, but personally, do you think we're going to have football this fall? And do you think fans will be a part of that? Um, you know, I, you know, I have said this before, I'm really an optimistic person, um, but I wouldn't say I'm overly confident that we are going to do that. Um, so much depends on probably really two key issues. One is really our national trend across the country in, in, the, in the number of cases. Obviously, we have seen it really escalate recently. And so if that continues on that trajectory, that would not be a, a very good fact for us. Um, and then really access to, you know, testing and time results. So that's another key issue is, is making sure we have access to tests and, and results as quickly as possible and, and that sort of thing. So those two factors are really, really important. Um, Fans uh, will really be dependent on the governor's orders. Um, you know, we're working really closely with the Steelers on um, what a stadium at Heinz Field would look like if we were social distanced. Um, you know, we, we do have projections that, you know, we could probably get somewhere between 15 to 18, 20,000 at the max um, in Heinz Field if everybody was socially distanced. But again, that is, um, we are steps away from any chance of, of doing that at this point in time. So um, I think our, our number one priority is trying to focus on our team and our student athletes and the schedule and, and see if we can really manage through that piece of it to start. Heather, just curious, you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks that kind of things were going well with the, the athletes coming back on campus and everything. Across the country, we've seen, you know, college football programs having to shut down or, you know, whatever, pause workouts. Has that, has that happened at all since, you know, pit football players have come back, uh, you know, on campus for you guys? Have you ever had to consider that? Uh, we have not yet, knock on wood, um, thankfully. Um, uh, you know, we definitely have very strict protocols in place um, and uh, plans. If someone, you know, if, if someone is positive, they go into isolation. We have 19 people in our athletic department trained for contact tracing. We're very thorough about that. Um, again, I, I, I would say that um, everybody is taking it very seriously. And um, coaches, you know, are all wearing masks and 
um, you know, really setting the example for our student athletes as well, that this is just how we are right now. This is how we have to be. Um, you know, I see coaches walking through the parking lot, even near the peat, and they're all in masks when they're outside. So before they even enter the peat. So um, yeah, I, I think that so far we have not had to contemplate that, John, and, and thankfully not. Heather, I, th I think August 7th is a date that football is supposed to start when you bring 100 guys together for football practice. Uh, do you believe the governor's going to let that happen? And, and if not, have you talked about ways to practice uh, in smaller groups, in staggering times maybe? Yeah, you can imagine Coach Narduzzi is being really flexible. He doesn't have any worry about the plan or timing or what. You know, I mean, coaches by nature, as we all know, are absolute creatures of habit. At 837, we will be doing this. At 839, we'll be doing that. So it is really, um, again, they are, they're, the, t the staff has just been great because they have been understanding that we can't give them all the answers that they want today. And so the answer, the question about whether or not we're going to be able to have 115 guys together on August 8th, 7th, I honestly don't know. I mean, it's July 23rd. It's a couple weeks out. Um, we're hoping that we can get to 50 um, in a reasonable manner. But right now we're staying at 25 and we'll stay at 25. And um, coaches are adapting and um, figuring out new ways to to work together and uh, watch film and you know we're not in small meeting rooms anymore they're spread out and the big team meeting room has X's over all the chairs that you can't sit in and so they are adapting and um, you know we're hopeful but I, again I'm not super optimistic that it's going to be a very traditional fall camp season. Heather, right now, it's all um, well and good. You've got these guys on campus now. You haven't had to cancel workouts. Like, it seems like it's going well. You know, a month from now, you bring 15,000 18 to 21-year-olds on campus. I mean, are, are there plans? You know, the NBA has the bubble, right? You know, and NHL has their hub cities. I mean, you can't confine college kids to their apartments. But, I mean, I don't know. What, what's the plan? How do you try to keep these guys minimize exposure as much as possible? Right. Uh, well, uh, I, I was teasing the chancellor. I said, you know, if you could come up with some like hormone therapy where college kids don't need to interact, you know, I mean, it's like, it's impossible to keep kids away from one another. Right. So um, it really is. And, um, and yet I do think putting the protocols in place, trying to be socially distanced, trying to, you know, everybody wearing a mask, we're going to do the best we possibly can, but there's no question when you bring, that many students back, um, you know, I expect that there will be some, some increase in, in cases. Hopefully it is not um, really exorbitant, but um, you know, our, our academic model and our housing model for campus is set up to be um, socially distanced. And uh, obviously the university has also um, managed to develop a plan for housing with regards to you know, students living in, we have hotels that we've rented um, and dormitories. There's not going to be communal bathrooms. People are going to have their bedroom and bathroom to themselves. Um, so it's designed to limit as much as possible um, the interactions, but the reality is they are going to interact. There's no question. Heather, how many tests have you guys administered so far? Oh gosh, I, I honestly don't have a running count, Jerry. Heather, we, we've seen, I mean, some high profile universities, you know, make some pretty significant cuts. I mean, look what Stanford announced a couple of weeks ago. I'm sort of curious, I mean, where, where does Pitt stand in terms of looking at their options in terms of the sports that they offer? Has there been talk about, you know, eliminating some or, or cutting the number of scholarships or having some sort of cutbacks in, in areas, excuse me, specifically non-revenue sports? Yeah. Um... I would just say, fortunately, um, really fortunately, we are not in a position at all to make any of those tough, tough decisions. Um, our university has been extraordinarily supportive. Our board of trustees has been equally supportive of the value that athletics brings to Pitt. I think it's an integral part of our university. It's, it's woven into the fabric of, 
of, uh, you know, when you think about Pitt, you think about Pitt athletics and in the city of Pittsburgh, you think about sports. So um, fortunately, we're in a really good position that the university is, is uh, very financially sound and making wise decisions with regards to finances moving forward. And we are not contemplating any of those tough decisions. And they're obviously the Big Ten uh, a couple of weeks ago announced they were going to be conference only. Uh, how much has that been a topic and what are advantages if you guys would only play ACC teams? Uh, it's definitely been a topic, Jeff. Um, as I mentioned, we have definitely talked about really every iteration under the sun uh, with regards to football scheduling uh, and conference scheduling for all sports, frankly. Um, there are advantages in the sense that um, you get to have a very, you know, um, uh, unified uh, group of schools. Uh, we all agree to the certain medical guidelines that we are, you know, required to follow. Um, we, if there are cancellations or some a school can't do it, there's a li you're able to be a little bit more flexible when you're just managing. 15 teams in the ACC as opposed to, you know, non-conference states and schedules and such. So um, I think there's some advantages to that, um, given the uniqueness of this year, obviously. Um, in general, you wouldn't want to do that, but with regards to what we're all facing and just trying to get games in, there's probably some advantages to that philosophy. And they're getting back really briefly to uh, your testimony yesterday. Did you consult any student athletes before you made that testimony? You know, we, we talked with the ACC Student Athlete Advisory Council. So every ACC school has two representatives on that council. Um, and when we, and this was a while ago, Stephen, so it wasn't um, contemporaneous with um, my testimony per se, but a while ago when we, the ACC came up with their formalized position, it was actually proposed and supported by the presidents and chancellors of the universities, supported by the athletic directors. We had faculty athletic representatives, so faculty perspective, and then the Student Athlete Advisory Council, who were all unanimous, unanimously supportive of opposing gambling on college sports. Mike, I believe you had a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Heather. Uh, hi. <laughs> Vision two, uh, the PSAC is uh, looking at moving their fall sports to the spring. H what type of possibility is that for you guys and how much has that been in discussion? Yeah, we have discussed that as well. Um, um, it is a possibility um, if we had to shut down fall sports for some reason. Um, it is honestly a pretty significant logistical challenge. Um, we could, you know, I think at Pitt, we could definitely manage it. Um, there are some schools that have a lot more sports than us and, you know, share fields and share facilities. And it's, it's a lot to put in on. It's a lot for your staff, too. For example, we have athletic trainers who um, may oversee, uh, for example, women's soccer and baseball. So if you put those seasons together, soccer and baseball in the same season, where does the athletic trainer go? So we don't have one trainer for every single sport. So there are some challenges um, staffing wise and facility wise with regards to that plan. But um, we are talking about it and, and analyzing all of that. Hey, there's a possibility that the NCAA could vote tomorrow on fall championships. Uh, you know, they might make a decision there. It seems like that's what the reports are. Are you hopeful that they'll kind of kick the can down the road and maybe not make a decision tomorrow and if they do what kind of pressure does that put on FBS the power five schools college football playoff to then make a similar decision yeah um well I am hopeful that they make you know I don't know that there's any right decisions right now you know I, I, we're in uncharted territories no one has been through what we're all going through is it you know, right to go to the grocery store or not? Is it right to go to a Little League baseball game right now? Is it right to go to, um, you know, activity? You know, it's just, is it right to go on vacation? You know, all those sorts of things. So I don't know what the right, there, I don't think there is a right decision. Um, but I do think that they are going to take um, as much information as possible and try to make this decision. Um, and I, there is some 
you know, there is some hope that, you know, let's wait and try to assess things as much as possible because, you know, I, a month ago, you might've said, hey, we're ready. You know, like, let, this is great. The trend, we're all trending down. The numbers are going down everywhere. And then suddenly three, four weeks later, we're setting record numbers across the Southern states, and, you know? And so I think it's just so hard to predict. So the longer they can wait, I think everybody is a little bit more hopeful that they wait um, to make any tough, like, you know, to really cancel things. Um, because maybe it does change and maybe the trend does go in a different direction. But yeah, I, I, I don't know honestly what they're going to do. Um, and then if they would cancel fall championships, it, it obviously, um, it's a domino to how do we manage football and what do we do from there? So a lot of those conversations are uh, being had and, and discussed and, you know, just trying to come up with the best plan possible for, um, the safety of our student athletes and, and our staff. I mean, that is paramount. And so, um, you know, there's economic reasons for sure, but we got to make sure we can do things safely. Heather, is there a drop dead date for some of these decisions to be made? I mean, we are at the end of uh, July, which is surprising when I think about it, but are we getting close to, we have to have a decision by X to make things happen? Yeah, I, there's no question. I mean, I think, um, uh, we, you know, in May, we were like, oh, we'll, we'll talk about this in July. And, you know, and, and here we are almost the end of July. And, and there is that sense of, of, hey, we've got to make some decisions. So I think the next two weeks are pretty critical um, for decision making on whether it's scheduling or championships and, and those sorts of things. So I think in the next couple of weeks, it, it is going to really, um, the final, some, some, some final decisions will be made. Also, have you been able to talk to some of the student athletes, athletes back on campus? Um, this has to be a whirlwind for them as well. Are they just focused in denial that everything will be fine, or are they dealing with the roller coaster of, you know, their season might be disrupted in a big way, especially the seniors? Yeah. Um, yes, I have had, uh, I've been on a lot of Zoom calls with teams um, and our student athletes, and I've seen them too in person um, from a distance and with a mask, but um uh, yeah, I would say that they are um, very emotional and, um, you know, it's unsettling, I guess, if, if that's probably the best description of it. It's, you know, there's just so much unknown, you know, and when you think about your own personal college career and you knew, um, you know, you're, you're moving into your dorm or you're moving into your first apartment with your college roommates and you knew that what that was going to look like and you knew your class schedule and you knew where you're going to go to class. I mean, it's just not like that at all. Um, you know, am I going to be living in the place where I said I was going to be living? Am I going to be taking classes? Are the classes going to be online? I just saw um, Patrick Narduzzi, you know, Coach Narduzzi's son is out here playing golf because he's like the real golfer in the family. Don't, don't pick coach on your team. Uh, but, uh, and I said, hey, Patrick, uh, what's your fall look like? And uh, he said, well, I know one of my classes, I just got, it, it really feels like that's going to be online. And then the other two are not, you know, so kids are, it, it's very unsettling. Um, and, and frankly, um, you know, they want to play because I think it gives them, a, you know, it's an outlet for them. It's a purpose for them. And they've, it's a part of their DNA. They've, They've never not played sports for three or four months. Um, and working out from home and doing those things are just not ideal. Um, so I think they want, they love kids. I mean, whether you believe it or not, kids do crave structure. They crave a purpose. They crave structure. Um, they crave accountability um, and discipline. And, and that, those are all the traits that they get from, from college sports. So I think um, they're really anxious and um, hopeful. I guess I would say. Heather, considering the, the economic fallout that's uh, coming from all, down from all of this, has there been talk about uh, voluntary salary cuts for some people, furloughs, things like that? Um, you know, I, in talking with our university um, leadership, uh, you know, I think every aspect has been evaluated. We have not been asked to do any of that yet, very thankfully. Um, uh, Again, I would say our university has been incredibly supportive of the staff across the board, not just in athletics, but across our university staff. Um, Chancellor Gallagher is an extraordinary leader and has to really prioritize the people and, um, you know, flexibility. 
and uh, remote working and additional vacation time for, or illness, I should say, sick time, um, two extra weeks of sick time if anybody needs to take it. Um, so, so far we have not been asked to do that. Um, obviously, uh, you know, we're still early on in this process and, and uh, you know, very hopeful that a vaccine comes along in the next year that we can uh, get back to a new normal. So it's, it's a little bit hard to predict long-term those decisions, but right now that's where we stand. Do we have any additional There's questions? There's been a lot of uh, talk about doing you know, whatever, moving th things to the spring or pushing dates back or non-conference. Has there been any meaningful conversations about uh, maybe in particular sports, changing the way th things have always been done to make s those sports um, safer to play during a pandemic, whether that's, I don't know, you know spreading out the field at a cross country meet or, uh, you know, wrestling outdoors, or I don't know, ha have those kind of uh, conversations come up at all? Um, you know, I think this, this pandemic has given us a chance to evaluate everything that we do. Um, in a little different way. Um, whether it's a Zoom call, like I'd much rather be in person with you all, but, um, but it's interesting how we can get donors from all across the country on a Zoom call with a head coach and it's just efficient, you know? Um, uh, wrestling, we'd love, I'd love to wrestle at Heinz Field Outdoors, let's do that. Um, and, uh, and sell the place out, we'll do Pitt Penn State wrestling on the mat, Coach Gavin's ready to roll. Um, no, yeah, we have not done real drastic decisions like that, thoughts about that. Um, but I, I, I think the the cleanliness of our facilities is is uh, has really been enhanced. Um, I think the protocols have been followed, um, and so you know we haven't done significant changes to the way a game is played necessarily, Alan, but. Um, I think it has caused us to look at, you know, for example, mobile ticketing. You know, we've been kind of dragging our feet or people, you know, some people have been dragging their feet on mobile ticketing. Well, guess what? We're mobile ticketing. The way we do concessions. Um, yes, we need to have Wi-Fi in the Pete. Thank goodness we got it in last year. So you can order your concessions mobily. I don't have to stand online and stand, you know, in, in a jammed up place. So um, I think it's allowed us to do, you can buy merchandise online. Um, you can buy merchandise from your phone at a game. Those types of things we've been able to, I think, allowed us opportunities to, to make the decision and, and do it. Um, so th there's some really positive examples that have come out of the pandemic too. Heather, with fall sports, is it all or none? Or is there a possibility where, say, football could be played and the other sports could move to another time? Yeah, that conversation is yet to be had definitively. Um, you know, if the NCAA cancels fall sports, that would be the fall sports. Um, football obviously has a separate championship run by the college football playoff. Um, but we will have to cross that bridge if that becomes the case and then really discuss um, that possibility. Heather, was there, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was just going to ask really quick. Um, I know that some schools and some teams have, have asked players to sign uh, either waivers or, you know, COVID pledges. Have, uh, have any pit teams or have you guys as an athletic department asked your student athletes to do such a thing? Right. No, we do not have waivers. That has not been our approach. You're not waiving that sort of thing. What we have done is talk about uh, two things. One is really increased education. So when they come back, they meet with our medical team um, on Zoom, um, and we walk through all the medical I, terminology and understanding of what you know um, COVID is, and then we talk about um, their accountability. We call it Panther accountability. When you come to our facilities, eventually you'll see this sort of yield sign with a panther with a mask over it, and that visible representation is their acknowledgement of their, their role and responsibility in this. So if kids walk into facilities without a mask, I mean, you know, that's, that is their acknowledgement that they're exposing themselves. So we call it Panther accountability, our, their acknowledgement of their responsibility in the effort to try to stay safe. Heather, I was hoping you could clarify something um, real quick and then I have a, a separate question. 
I'll have to keep it short. Um, you mentioned in, in terms of non-conference opponents in football that they would have to be abiding by the ACC protocols. Does that mean that they're already doing that at their, on their campus now and then so that when they get here, they're following it? Or is it just like when they're here, they have to follow whatever guidelines you guys set? No, it, it will be that um, when, if and when we would play a non-conference school, if the medical guidelines say that, for example, you have to test all of your student athletes, you know, the week of a game or 72 hours before a game, they would have to do that and they would have to commit to that, um, uh, that and, be able, and, and, and actually be able to do it in order for us to play, if that makes sense. Um, all right, and just uh, unrelated, but um, obviously you guys announced a big fundraising initiative last fall. I'm just curious, with Victory Heights, have you had to alter your timeline on any of that? I think I asked that maybe a couple months ago, but obviously I thought we'd be done by now, yeah. and obviously we're not. So I'm um, just sort of curious if there's any update to that. Yeah, I would say um, Victory Heights is, is uh, the fundraising aspect is moving forward we're really sensitive to everybody's individual situations, but um, we have gotten some really nice gifts um, recently towards Victory Heights, so that's a good thing. Um, so we're strategically continuing to fundraise for Victory Heights. Um, the project itself is, is um, we are moving forward with some designs, and um, but the technical project is, um, the capital project I would say overall is on hold. There's a whole number of, I should say on pause. Um, there's a lot of capital projects right now that are on pause for the university pending where the financial situation goes. So for example, the chiller plant or um, uh, like the, 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 the couple of the hillside projects, the, the rerouting of the road, that is still moving forward. So aspects of the hill projects are going forward and a couple of them are paused right now, you know, maybe six months. Um, but we, we, it, there's no lack of need, there's no lack of support from the chancellor, our board for the need for Victory Heights. Um, so it will pick up and move as soon as it possibly can. Heather, very quickly, um, I forget if you mentioned this at, at the start or not, but uh, the football team, are they, um, are, have they reached the, the walkthrough film study phase of, of getting back into it? Or are they still just doing the work with strength and conditioning staff right now? Um, this week was the first week that they could actually do some um, on-field uh, work. But, um, but, but up until this point, it's just been the strength staff. Is, is there any idea when that, that walk through that, uh, that, that, that period where they can meet with coaches? Do you know when that will start by any means? Um, gosh, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say because I don't have the okay. calendar right in front of me. Sorry. All right, no worries. You can follow up with you on that, John. Yeah, oh. yeah, let him know. Do we have any additional final questions before we let Heather get to her uh, ambassador role on the course, even though she's not playing? Yeah. With that, hey, I thank everyone for joining us this morning. Heather, thank Thanks, you for yeah. your time. Again, we'll send you out the video of this session, and uh, please feel free to give me a shout after the call concludes if you have any follow-up needs. But much appreciation to everybody, and have a great day.